So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker. We have tonight um, Michael Brophy. He's a nationally known professional genealogical researcher. He's an air search specialist and lecturer from the Boston area. He has served as the program director and publicity director for the Massachusetts Genealogical Council. He was featured on the Irish TV stories, Dead Money, a genealogy TV show about air searchers. He has lectured on a variety of genealogical subjects and specializes in New England and Irish genealogy. He will be talking tonight about forensic genealogy, law and order meets family history. And so Michael, do you wanna share your screen with us? Sure can. I guess we're ready to go. Thank you all for coming here tonight, so to speak. Um, I'm coming to you from a very cold Boston, Massachusetts with um, the Prince and Princess of Wales in town right now on a charitable visit. It's the buzz of Boston right now. Maybe it will make the national news too. Um, but anyway, I want to talk about forensic genealogy. This is the kind of genealogy that I practice and as a professional genealogist in the field. And it is certainly a growing field as well as challenging um, uh, for, for folks. And I think quite interesting, fascinating. See a lot about it in the news. Um, I wanna first start off by introducing somebody who is a bit infamous, we might say. Uh, you might recognize this fellow from the news. This is James Joseph D'Angelo. He was better known as the Golden State Killer. Um, Ex-police officer, serial rapist, serial murderer. Um, who committed at least 13 more mur murders and about 50 rapes back in the 1970s and 80s in California. They couldn't catch him for years. Um, but he went down from no Northern California down to Southern California. Um, and, you know, he, he and the press gave him multiple different nicknames back there in the 70s. So what they did was that they did collect some DNA uh, from some of the victims, and then they had a strong suspicion that this was the guy. So they got his DNA and compared it, and they found out conclusively um, that he was the Golden State Killer, and he was convicted of eight counts of first-degree murder uh, through DNA, and the genealogy site that he, they used was GEDmatch, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Okay, We'll speak a little bit about DNA during the course of this talk. Uh, but it's mostly going to be focusing, focusing in on forensic genealogy. So forensic genealogy, you know, is research analysis reporting on cases with legal implications. Key word is legal from my friend D.D. King, came up with that definition years ago. And this differs from traditional genealogy because it involves living people, as opposed to traditional genealogy when we're dealing with mostly dead folks, right? So reverse uh, forensic genealogy is, uh, means that we're starting from uh, a dead person and then moving them forward. It's also called reverse genealogy in, in, some, in some quarters, okay? We sort of go back a few generations, two or three generations to make it meaningful and then work our way forward. So as opposed to traditional genealogy, when we're going back to, uh, you know, the, to the ocean or, you know, back to the home country as to where our folks came from. So the time period that's really meaningful is about 1880 onward, um, roughly when the census started to be, uh, have every name on it, and the relationships were enumerated in the 1880 census. Um, beyond that, it's, it's really not all that meaningful. Um, the standards are the same for forensic genealogy, as far as the genealogical proof standard of doing a reasonably exhaustive search, citing your sources, um, analyzing and correlating your collected information, uh, resolving any conflicts that come up and write a conclusion. That's the genealogical proof standard. And that's what, uh, that's what we do as genealogists in a nutshell, okay? So the methodology is super important. Um, I did do a survey a few years ago of the Association of Professional Genealogists to figure out how popular this practice is. Uh, on the APG site, we list our specialties as to what folks are going into and what they're doing, okay? Um, so of the 2,700 members a few years ago when I did this, 352 listed a specialty of air searchers, about 13%, and 
and there's another specialty of forensic, um, which 129 listed, or 5%, and 66 mentioned adoption, which is a little bit less uh, popular, again, has legal implications when we're looking at uh, adoptions. So I tend to believe that, again, my numbers that I did this survey were a little bit, are, are a few years old. I suspect this number has grown um, in the last few years. I did the same thing for the Board of, uh, Board of Certification Genealogists, better known as BCG, a few years ago, had 240 members, about the same numbers, about 20 air searchers, 13, about 5% missing heirs, and a little bit less than that doing adoption due to the challenges of, of adoption research, which can be tough, tough research to do uh, because of privacy laws. And we'll see that in a few minutes. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. The first big area I want to talk about that has some is very popular and is has some real um, ethical issues associated with it is finding missing and unknown heirs in the legal industry in the states. All right, and this involves um, estates in which folks need to be notified that they might be entitled to an inheritance with or without a will, uh, and usually there's four big records that are used. Uh, when conducting this sort of research for lawyers and legal professionals and real estate folks who are searching for heirs. Number one is, of course, is vital records. Um, defined, again, I, I don't want to tell this audience to talk under this audience too much, but that's birth, marriage, death, and divorce records. You know, we all do two of them. Some of us do three or four. Um, and then there's the census, of course, and it's really the most meaningful censuses come from 1880 onward, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, as well as probate records, which I think are an underutilized resource within genealogy and traditional, as well as forensic genealogy, um, as well as obituaries, again, which can be reliable and sometimes not so reliable, okay? Nowadays, there's um, a lot of um, information that can be found about living people uh, that you have right at your fingertips as a genealogist. So if you're performing a family reunion or looking for somebody like me, if I were inheriting a, a fortune, um, you can do a premium white page search. And uh, if you kind of knew that I lived in Abington, Massachusetts, which is where I live and where I'm coming from here, and you kind of knew me, uh, that I was in my 50s, which I am, um, and, and have a few of my addresses um, and maybe knew a few of my relatives who are listed there, then you, you, you would know the people that we have here and you might be able to track me down very easily from a lot of websites that are publicly available. Um, so I, I actually did this. And again, this costs a couple bucks to do um, just on the whitepages.com. And there's loads of these sites out here. Um, in which it lists me with my correct birth date and the location. Um, these websites are not perfect because it does give a home phone number for me, the primary phone that they're clicking, that they're checking down there of 8780720, area code 781. That's a fax line I used to use. It's not 100% accurate. But down there at the bottom, you'll see my cell number, right? And that is accurate. You have it right on your handout that Kurt just put up in the chat a few minutes ago. All right, as well as some past phone numbers that uh, that I'm not using any longer. Okay, it also lists some of the some of the old addresses of the addresses that I that I live at. And again, these are accurate and not so accurate sometimes. Um, <clears throat> One ninety eight Patricia Drive, Abington. That is where I live. That's I'm on the second floor of the house right now. Um, Nine Tass Street, Marblehead, Mass. Is the house that I grew up in. That's where my dad lives. Uh, lived until last year. But there's some inaccurate stuff here as well. Um, I, again, I'm telling you from my own experience here that the address of 605 Middle Street, apartment 32, Braintree, Massachusetts, which is just south of Boston, I never lived there, but my wife did when she was single. So since our information is commingled, that's the, uh, that's the old condo that she lived in just before we were married 20 some odd years ago. Uh, but the rest of them are fairly uh, are, are accurate. Um, if we go down the bottom there, Gaslight Drive, apartment number 10 in South Weymouth. My wife and I lived there for six months when we were buying our house uh, now. And um, 
and you know we had some phones installed in there which is how i i'm sure that they tracked us down uh, because the phones were registered through the phone company um, at that address at apartment 10 on gaslight drive in south weymouth mass okay again um it, it will list my relatives and these are all correct as well uh, the blue boxes i blocked them out because it gives ages and i don't have permission to use my wife's age, but her name is Maura Brophy. That's her on the right there, Maura A. Brophy. It lists her general age there, not not it lists her in, in her in the decade that she was born, but not her exact date. So uh, uh, I'm blocking that out. But it does have close relatives if you were trying to track me down, um, including Patrick William Brophy. That's my brother. Mark Joseph Brophy. That's my other brother. Gail A. Somnier. Uh, that's my sister and Kathleen Mary Brophy. That's my other sister. So all my four of my siblings and my wife are listed right up top here, along with a few associates. Uh, they, they've tracked down a few people, a couple guys, uh, Craig Bosworth and Jimmy Austin, guys I used to live with when I was a bachelor over 20 years ago. Again, we shared an address at a, at, at a, uh, at a house that uh, was a few minutes ago that you saw in the last slide. So you can see that uh, a lot of this information, uh, good information for tracking down folks, whether it be for traditional research or otherwise, is available on the internet at, at uh, little to no cost. Here's another one that's that's totally for free. This is Zaba Search, and I'm using screenshots here, by the way. Um, it lists um, Maura A. Brophy, that is my wife. Um, at 198 Patricia Drive, and it's even listing our landline number of 781-878-9166. And I figure that, uh, as well as a nice Google map of where we are, um, and I, I think they list that name, the number under her because she's the only one who answers the phone in the house. Okay. So let's look at air searching. So we're tracking down airs here. Um, and most people in this country die without a will, okay? According to one statistic I saw, that 70% uh, of people in Texas in this survey that I saw die without a will. And the state law will determine how much property, both real and personal, um, it, it, it's going to take to probate in the state through probate court. So genealogists will be employed to, uh, to find a will uh, if an address is changed or an old will for notification purposes if the laws require that family members be notified of an estate proceeding, that's called due diligence. Um, the jurisdictions in which probate is done are very different from state to state. Um, in my home state of Massachusetts, it's done on the, in probate court on the county level, but in Pennsylvania, it's called orphan courts. In New York, it's surrogate court. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, they go down to the circuit court level. So you really have to know when looking at probate, uh, and, and, and heirs to estates as to where, what court of jurisdiction has the, the, the proceeding. Um, who can search for heirs on a professional basis? I mean, some states require a license to do this, and it's probably a good idea to check the Secretary of State's office in your state for licensing requirements. Um, and most, of, most states have open records um, as it relates to probate, but in New York, all divorce records are sealed from what my New York folks told me. Um, in my home state of Massachusetts, financial information is, is, is impounded in probate files uh, for divorces, as an example. Um, however, my friends in Texas tell me that it goes a lot further according to the law and the, for, for intestate proceedings, and we will see that in a few minutes. Okay, some detail on that. So the question becomes, who is an heir? And this really depends on the degree of consanguinity or the blood relation um, and whether it is real property or whether it is personal property as well. Um, so once again, this, this is something where you have to have some knowledge if you're going to practice forensic genealogy of the intestate laws of that particular state. So here's an example. Um, again, this is from the state of Texas. Um, and a little chart here talks about if a decedent dies uh, with separate property, as I blow this up a little bit on the left, you can say, see with, with children and their descendants, 
um, and the person dies with a surviving spouse, then personal property and real property are divided up a little bit differently. As you can see on the left there, where the surviving spouse gets a third of the personal property and the children and their descendants get a third of the personal property. And if we go over to the right and the intestate uh, person dies without children or their descendants, then personal property goes all to the, to the uh, surviving spouse and real property is divided up in, in, in very different ways. So you can see that, you know, it, 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 it depends on knowing the state law um, and knowing all the intricacies as to how these laws are, are, uh, uh, are put together, which is going to dictate our genealogical search and who we're looking for, uh, for legal purposes. I took a look at um, the Alabama state code here and uh, of the same thing, just to, to give a little uh, variety here. And, you know, the, it, it says right here in the code, the Alabama general law code, that the share of living spouse is divided as follows. If there's no surviving issue of parent of the decedent, the entire intestate estate. If there's no surviving issue, then the first $100,000 goes to the surviving spouse and one half of the balance to the intestate estate. So again, that's gonna dictate who we're looking for uh, when it comes to an air search uh, for forensic genealogists. I do wanna bring up some ethical considerations too uh, regarding the air search industry. Um, there are major companies out there that are sort of family dominated, privately held air search companies that have been around for a long time. Um, and I'm not going to mention any names, but some of them are very good genealogists and, and others are not. The variety, in my experience, varies quite a bit. Um, these people are, are, in my view, people, uh, business people first and genealogists second. So what these folks do is they search for lost heirs proactively um, and they use the courts and other sources to find people who have inherited money and don't know about it. Uh, once the heirs are found, they're, they're not told the amount or the source of the inheritance, typically. Uh, the typical pitch will go like, okay, we have we will tell you all the details of, of this inheritance that you have, but first you have to sign this agreement that says that 20, 30, even 40% of the proceeds um, will go to the air search company for their services. Um, the firm will pitch that they're taking the risk because you have to you're not paying any money for a lawyer and most people can't afford lawyers, okay? Um, so this air search industry, it's very competitive. Um, there's players in the US as well as overseas um, and, and many, many, many people die every day with huge sums of money that do not designate where that money is to go or, or who to leave it to. Um, so I was, a first, I was a part of this industry for a short time and I found it distasteful. Um, and uh, because I, th I thought it was unethical and it turns out it's illegal in certain jurisdictions in this country. Get into that in a second. The legal concept here around air search is called champerty. Um, and the common law says that the champerty uh, prohibits the sale of the fruit of a legal judgment or settlement, in our case, the a probate of an estate, in advance of such judgment to otherwise disinterested third parties. That would be the air search firm, okay? Three conditions have to exist for this, uh, that the air search firm has no legitimate interest in the suit. Uh, They're an uninvited guest to the proceeding, so to speak. Um, that party is uh, expending their own money, which they are. They're paying people to go into probate courts and look for intestate estates and the party shares in the proceeds. They're, they're, they're uh, sharing the proceeds with the rightful heirs, as well as the, uh, um, uh, the air search company. So legal scholars have come to the opinion um, that this, this practice is not something that uh, is in the public interest. It violates the legal doctrine of informed consent when huge fees are taken, if you can imagine, uh, signing up an heir who's the sole heir and inheriting a million dollar estate and they're taking 40%, then that's $400,000 for tracking down one person. And those kinds of huge fees um, uh, taken can be really unconscionable. Um, this encourages lawsuits. Um, and where you can imagine a, a, 
a scenario where an operator comes up with a business plan to, to sell part of a claim when a bunch of people are, say, hit by a city bus, and then they sell their claim to um, 1,800 people or so to, to fight the claim as a group. So the city would be forced to settle marginal claims and city services would be hurt as a result in this particular analogy. Okay. So in 30 plus states on their books, they have laws outlawing champerty um, by statute or judicial decision. Uh, in the state of Maine, uh, champerty actually has been criminalized and it carries jail time of six months. Um, it's also been codified in Kentucky, Michigan, Virginia, Missouri, um, and, and, and they have similar statutes, but they don't carry jail time like Maine does. Um, genealogists who are doing air search work ethically should be compensated by the hour and reimbursement for expenses as recommended by the Council for the Advancement of Forensic Genealogy, which is a, a group that's looking to um, uh, advance genealogy in an ethical and legal way. And full disclosure, I am the new president of that organization. Okay. So this is sort of the dirty undercu undercurrent of, uh, of genealogy that uh, has some bad actors out there. I will certainly not mention any names to protect the guilty. I did get a hold of a letter one time, though, um, about a, a letter that could be sent to these folks. And here's a screenshot of it that an heir sent me. Um, and they're saying, I'm writing to you regarding a, uh, a, a matter that our firm is working on. We've been in the business of locating unknown and missing heirs to probate state matters, dormant bank accounts, and et cetera. And they're talking about being the granddaughter of Irving Murphy and Anita Reynolds, we believe you are an interested party, may be entitled to certain assets associated with this matter, estimated to be worth $800,000, along with potential family members we may identify. This letter goes on to say that right at the top there that they were looking to take a third, 33 and the third percent uh, as well. And in, in the fourth line down, it says that we are unsuccessful in recovering any assets you will never be obligated to pay us in any way and would owe us nothing. Even if you signed and returned the paperwork and, you, and would, we could not recover anything for you, what have you lost? Nothing. So these are the letters that um, folks get by way of Federal Express or left at their door, uh, enticing them to sign an agreement such as this in which they're signing, uh, and again, I'm blocking out the air search company, an amount of one third of whatever proceeds I might receive from said assets. Um, and again, it's signed and dated by this heir back in 2015. Again, an unethical practice, and I believe in everywhere, but certainly illegal uh, by judicial decision and codified elsewhere. Okay, forensic genealogy, it's a big world. And there's a big industry out there in oil, gas, and mineral rights. You folks are from all around the country. And this is, of course, big business. Okay? There's, this isn't just involving uh, places like Texas and Oklahoma, where, you, you know, we, where that's, we all know that that's big business down there, the oil and gas industry. But 34 of the 50 states are involved um, in gas production, even in there in, in southern Indiana. Uh, in the Appalachian Basin uh, uh, east, as well as the uh, the Bakken area up there in North Dakota. So it's, um, again, this is big, big business. And the way this done is, is done, and it's the environmental uh, movement is, has made this controversial as well. It's, it's called hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which you may have heard of. And what they do is they fracture the ground uh, and, and put millions of gallons of water into uh, the shale of the earth. And this releases natural gas uh, for our consumption out there in the world. All right, and the gas is recovered um, and, and put into storage trucks and, and, and piped to market. Um, once again, it's, it's debatable as to whether this is something that is uh, ethical or not. Okay. That's an argument for another day. Um, a few words about the oil and gas industry. There, there are professionals in this industry, scientists, well-educated scientists, geologists and geophysicists. 
who study well logs and seismic data every day to determine um, where the next reserves of oil and gas are. And they work for companies in the industry who determine the business opportunity and the payout, et cetera. Next comes the landmen who come in and they run title to make sure that each track of the land uh, that they're studying has clean title, much in the way that your house has, should have clean title. Um, and each track of land is follow, they follow the deeds and they chain the deeds back much like a genealogist would do using the grantee grantor indices um, and, and chain back the deed uh, as far as possible back to sovereignty. Um, so landmen are not genealogists, they are business people um, and they often approach genealogists with sort of stick figure trees uh, outlining a family for the genealogist to find the interest. So typically the split is 80, 80 to 20 in favor of the oil company in which they are leasing land to drill for oil or gas from the landowners. Uh, it's usually rural landowners um, and sometimes the federal government, they've been leasing out their lands, the Bureau of Land Management lands um, and flat rates are, depend on the deals as well as percentages. Um, let's see. You, the usual strategy that they have is to, is to contact the big loan and owners first and get them to sign agreements. And then the little guys, small landowners will follow. They do, they do it in three to 500 blocks uh, first for, for drilling rights. After the agreements are signed, there, there, then comes the spud date, as they say in that industry. And this is the date that the drill bit hits the ground and it's drill baby drill. And there's a deadline from a lot of landmen and genealogists uh, to get the work done. So um, sometimes it is mineral rights. There's real versus personal property and real property uh, is what's in the ground uh, and personal property is what comes out of the ground. So minerals are actually real property to start with uh, and then uh, personal property afterwards. And again, as we saw in Texas, that's going to be uh, different for how things are divided up. So what's this got to do with genealogy, okay? Genealogists find the heirs and build the family trees for these this land if, it's a, if there's an issue with the titles, right? And we find the heirs and we bring them forward. Um, if the landman or attorney finds something unusual in the, in the chain of title, say from the 1930s, then a forensic genealogist is hired to find the heirs of John Smith and report who the legal heirs at law are. Um, landmen are business people. They want it fast. They want it accurate. They want it affordable because this is a, uh, they're in the business of making money, okay? One of the things that's uh, an ethical concern here is that genealogists uh, do not divide up percentages as to who gets what percentage of the land. That is the, uh, the province of an attorney, of a real estate attorney, uh, and that is an unlicensed practice of law. And I have seen some genealogists who have done that, and that is a big no-no. And sometimes attorneys, We'll ask genealogists to do that, and that that should not be done. So, for you folks who are coming from land uh, areas that are rich in, in gas and, and minerals, this is something to look into, or at least be interested in. Our next one is adoption. Forensic genealogist has everything to do with legal purposes. Adoption is a legal process. I am an adoptive father. I have a fifteen-year-old daughter downstairs right now who is the uh, the love of our life, okay? And she's making it through her teenage years too. So I'll talk a little bit briefly about adoption. Alex Haley said it great, I think when it relates to adoption. Uh, in all of us, there is a hunger, marrow deep, to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. Without this enriching knowledge, there's a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments of life, there is a most disquieting loneliness. And I think that has everything to do with adoption. When it comes to adoption in this country, um, six in 10 Americans have a personal attachment to adoption, meaning that they have a close family member or friend who's been adopted uh, or is a child of an adoptive person um, or is an adoptive parent. And that's where I come in. That's called the adoption triad. 2% uh, of the, all the children in this country are adopted. Um, these are private records. Most records are kept within the probate courts um, and they are open to under special circumstances that we will talk about. 
whenever you're doing research into an adoptive relative, do not use the A word, that's adoption. So even if the records are open, then I think most clerks have been trained for years to say private, 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 genealogist, you can't have it, all right? Uh, even, if, even if that's not even the law, all right? And certainly there are access issues. Um, there is a debate in this country, powerful arguments on both sides uh, of, the, uh, of the righteousness of giving out information that we as professional genealogists are, are commissioned to find, say, a birth parent. Um, I believe that if you're going to be doing this, you need to have an agreement ahead of time uh, that, that you might need to contact that birth parent first and ask them if they want to be contacted as a matter of privacy. Um, if the studies are correct, uh, most adopted kids want to know who their birth parents are. Uh, but there are powerful arguments on both uh, sides of this, which I will not get into uh, in this lecture. Okay. So the way adoptions worked in this country is that older Americans, if you're over a certain age, you might remember the old norms in which adoption was rare, that, that sudden pregnancies resulted in a quick, they called it a shotgun marriage, um, or the mother was sent away quietly to a home for unwed mothers for six, uh, nine months um, and, and given birth, and then the child was put up for adoption. Um, a, a child whose parents passed away was sent to live with grandparents or some other relative uh, without a court proceeding. It was settled within the family. Uh, adoption in those days was transparent and it was informal. Um, in orphaned, in, I'm sorry, in urban areas, uh, orphaned and abandoned kids were more likely to be left to fend for themselves and viewed with suspicion, uh, creating negative um, stereotypes for adopted persons. So in Massachusetts, it's the first state to pass the adoption law in the country to protect the welfare of adoptive children in 1851, and 24 states followed suit fairly quickly. Uh, the records were not sealed uh, when these acts came in from Massachusetts and 24 other states after that. Um, however, in 1917 in Minnesota, the, the adoption community changed its thinking and decided to protect the integrity of the adoptive family um, and the adoption records will be closed and amended birth certificates uh, would be issued with the adoptive parents listed as the parents. So the original birth certificates would be sealed. Right? So secrecy was thought to protect the child from public shame of, of an illegitimate birth um, or in unwanted intrusion from the birth mother to the adoptive parents. So this practice went into effect in the 1920s and 30s, except for two states, Alaska and Kansas, which never acted, right? And nowadays, uh, there's a trend nowadays towards opening up access, at least to original birth certificates for adopted persons. And uh, when I update this talk, folks, um, the last time I gave this a couple, I don't know, year ago or so, this number was nine states, it's now 12. Um, allow adoptees access and you can see the list um, as it's as it is here, and this is a trend, and I believe that adoption is becoming more and more access, and there's open records for access um, because of um, DNA. Okay, it's sort of forcing the issue, in my opinion. So, for tracking down folks, um, again, for in the pre-closure period before the, the Minnesota laws, I think we we all know, you know, there's as experienced genealogists out here to conduct family interviews, to go into the census, um, even looking at orphanage records uh, for churches that may have sponsored kids who were uh, born out of wedlock. Um, even newspapers called for uh, petitions for birth fathers and things like that. And even things like court docket books, which we're going to uh, um, see in a minute, an example of. Um, in the post-closure period, I'm sorry, there was the pre-closure period was pre-1920 or so. This is the post-closure period. Um, you know, the court petition, an adoptee can go before the court of jurisdiction um, if they were adopted uh, and petition the, co the court showing good cause, as they say, to see their original birth certificate or adoption records. It's usually for medical reasons or genetic testing of some kind. Um, my experience tells me from Talking to folks on this, that the, the success rates are very small on this. 
uh, but it's certainly worth a try. Um, 30 states have mutual consent registries in which the, the birth parent and the adoptee can, can uh, register and, and be matched up under certain circumstances. Uh, the success rates on these are low, but uh, it's certainly worth a try. And of course, this is a DNA lecture series, and we all know the beauty of DNA that is, in my opinion, forcing the issue uh, because DNA is a matching game, right? If you're looking for uh, a, a paternal match, then you know, get a Y DNA test. And, and if you come up with the same surname, uh, then you can certainly go into the, to the databases and reach out to these people, compare it with your traditional research and see where they intersect. Um, if, if you're doing that particular test, I recommend that you get as many uh, Y DNA markers as possible uh, that you can afford. Um, if all other avenues failed and you request medical information that, that excludes you know, identifying information like names, addresses, telephone numbers, birth dates, that sort of thing. Um, and that can be done through the uh, adoption agency or the state in which the adoption, uh, whoever handled the adoption. And of course, traditional research, as we talked about, probates, obituaries, vital records, even nowadays in social media, which is certainly not traditional research. But for tracking down um, adoptees, I mean, here's the 1930 census in Portland, New York. And the fifth person down in the Seabolt family is Carrie Dalton, and she is listing her relationship as the adoptive mother of Lester Seabolt. That should tell us a lot. Here's a birth certificate um, in which the from Texas, um, in which the the, the uh, birth of a child, the mother lists her residence as an orphanage. You see at the top there, Joshua home. Um, I'm sorry, the mother, uh, Teresa Black, is listing the Corsican, the Corsicana orphanage. Um, and certainly I would pursue that, those records, and this was found right on Ancestry.com. Here's a church record, baptismal record. This is from the Catholic Church um, right here in Boston. Um, and they're baptizing a child here. Um, and it says I-L-L. In the lower left-hand corner, this is John McGill, and it's spelled I-L-L-E-G. Joanna is the mother baptizing um, this child here, um, and the I-L-L-E-G stands for illegitimate. Uh, it's not Ignatius, as some person <laughs> said to me when looking at this record. This is a court docket book I mentioned a minute ago. This is from Norfolk County in, in Massachusetts. Um, publicly available docket book, but the records are closed for the adoption proceeding in Massachusetts and most other states. But you can get a hold of the court docket book. And here you have the index here of Mary Celia and Somerville, adoption change in name. And then we go to the court docket book. Um, and here you have a petition for adoption, change of name, decree of adoption, change to Emily Clara Brainerd. Okay, all publicly available information in my closed state here of Massachusetts. And again, that information uh, from the court docket books might be all that you need. You might not even may need to look at the record itself. Um, here's online at, at good old family search here in which we have a surrogate. Uh, this is in New Jersey in surrogate courts um, in which we have a 1936 adoption for Joan Louise Betts and it's giving us the docket number and the case here as well. And again, we can take this uh, information and bring it forward as well. Just blow this up here. Jean Louise Betts adoption, docket number, number of case. Um, and again, it's giving us the documents on the bottom there that are associated with it, including the petition as well as the decree uh, for the surrogate courts in New Jersey. Here's another one. This is the legal decree for adoption for a, a friend of mine, his dad, a well-known adoption. Um, this is the decree itself, in which it is appearing that Leonard, the father and only person required by law to consent, has joined in prayer for this particular petition uh, for the purposes of the child for Leon Francis. And uh, this is again down in Providence. Uh, there's Leon Francis. I blocked out the names here. This is not the record itself, but again, I'm protecting privacy here. 
respectfully represents Thomas of Providence and Maria Josephine. They are desirous of adopting the above child. We have birth dates, um, all kinds of good information here um, uh, that was done in the city of Providence, Rhode Island. Here's another one from California. This is the decree of adoption for another genealogist friend of mine. Uh, this is Arthur and Veronica and Verona. Those are the adopted parents, and they are desiring for adopting Rodney Jean right there in the center near the top. And it goes down to talk about Arthur and Verona. Um, and down at the bottom is here, it says about the 13th of June, 1921, said Rodney Jean was born out of wedlock to Nellie Louise. And Nellie, we list her last name. So again, you have our birth mother. So again, that's where we can sort of track this down um, if these, avail if these uh, records are available to you. Um, going on this one as well. Uh, again, this is just a blow up of the same record. Uh, this this was done through the Children's Home Society of California by Arthur and Verona. Uh, once again, listing 1921 as the as the magic date of adoption. Um, Family Search is expanding these records as well. Uh, here we have Gerald Boyd. Uh, this is from Calhoun County, Michigan. Again, listing the adoption proceeding as well as the docket numbers and things like that in the probate index in Calhoun County, Michigan. Um, again, listing the records so we can track these folks down. Okay. Got a whole talk on adoption, but we can't get totally into it. Next thing I want to talk about, forensic genealogists for legal purposes, is dual citizenship. Very popular out there. Lots of reasons for doing it. For ethnic or cultural pride. Um, I am married to an Irish citizen. My wife's grandparents were from Ireland, um, as well, and that makes our daughter eligible for Irish citizenship, but I'm not, because my Irish ancestry goes way back. Um, and there's lots of reasons for doing it. Um, you know, there's the, if you want to retire in one of the EU countries or something like that, you, you have the ability to work and to go school to school there with dual citizenship. Um, and if you become a citizen of Italy or Ireland, you become a citizen of 20 other members of the European Union, uh, which doesn't mean that you can run for being, you know, the Chancellor of Germany, but it certainly eases your travel as well, makes travel restrictions easier when you have that EU passport. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, it might not be a good idea to be traveling as an American in certain parts of the world today. Um, you know, we are genealogists here. We're typically an older crowd of over 40, and there are experimental medical treatments that are not subject to long FDA approvals. So some folks do this to gain uh, access to experimental medical procedures over in Europe. Um, and I've done some dual citizenship applications and things for business owners who are looking for business opportunities internationally, surely help if they were a citizen of the EU as well. So there's two, two ones in particular I want to talk about, and that is Irish and Italian. It seems to be the two biggest ones out there. Um, and again, if your grandparent was born in Ireland, um, and your parent is, a, the parent is a citizen through, so the grandparent is the key. Um, if the grandchild was born or naturalized or adopted here, legally adopted, then they are eligible for Irish citizenship and can be put into the foreign birth register. Um, which makes them eligible for Irish citizenship. So for you folks of Irish descent who have a grandparent uh, who was born in Ireland, uh, the documents that you'll need to get are you know, current US vital records, not, not old ones, um, naturalization documents certified if, if applicable, um, and any name change documents, particularly for you women who lose your names in, in marriage, right? And of course, adoption records, uh, if, if, if applicable. Um, my experience tells me that from hearing that most Irish citizen applications are simple and that they are accepted. Uh, there was one sort of Irish, um, uh, if you come up negative, then it's great to have forms to show an unsuccessful search. 
Um, and certainly they will accept substitutes from time to time as well. Um, I haven't, the records are pretty good for the last hundred years or so anyway in Ireland. So I haven't seen that to be necessary in the ones that I've done. Let's speak to you folks who are Italians out there. Um, it doesn't limit the number of generations. You can go all the way back, but the key date here is, is 17th of March, 1861. Um, you the person had to be alive in Italy after that because that's the date in which Italy became a nation, um, at least in the modern sense. Um, and this isn't a, a really big deal because most Italians came to this country well after 1861 through Ellis Island in the latter part of the 19th century, early 20th century. Um, January 1, 1948, um, you can do this through a female ancestor uh, after this date, as long as the uh, citizenship was passed on at that date. Uh, before, it, before that, it was only for men, so we can do it through our mothers through 1948, uh, more recent development in, in Italian dual citizenship. Um, the Italian documents are a bit more um, uh, complicated from Irish just as a, as, as a means of comparison. Uh, they look for uh, apost uh, uh, apostilles, uh, the ancestor's birth certificate, which is a format internacional, uh, and, or the estrata per resonanto. My Italian is terrible, folks, I apologize, as well as the spouse that you're going, going through. Uh, once again, the, the, the the certificates need to have seals on them as well as be certified. Um, all naturalizations need to be nat uh, gotten through the National Archives and, and sealed and naturalized. Translated documents, if the if birth certificates or marriage certificates are in Italy and they need to be translated through a translator as well, um, as well as results of unsuccessful searches, okay? Substitutes can be put out there like baptismal records and church records, um, uh, but really need to be thinking creatively when it comes to this. And this is where, um, you know, the, we, we have to <laughs> be, um, to have relationships with the, with the consulates, I think is, is, is important, okay? So Italian consulates, and there's one here in Boston as well as in other places too, um, it's an appointment process and it can take up to two years. So I certainly would not be in any rush. Um, uh, I've heard through colleagues that uh, Los Angeles and Miami are very strict uh, where others are, are more relaxed. Uh, there are reasons for rejecting these things where, which is, you know, lack, some people don't provide the translations. Uh, step parents are subbed in for birth parents. There's no seals. Those are the reasons for rejections for Italian citizenship. Um, and there's a list on the syllabus um, if Italian or Irish are not eligible for. You really need, for dual citizenship, you really need to check the, your local consulate. Um, and there was one sort of revenue play done by the Irish government, a certificate of Irishness, which was sort of put out for many years ago um, for increasing tourism in Ireland that did not last long for folks like myself who are of Irish descent, but not eligible for uh, citizenship. But that went away if, if you happen to have applied for that process. Okay. My next topic, military repatriation. For you patriotic folks out there, uh, this is something that is uh, we hear about again in the news, a big area of forensic genealogy. Um, this is uh, about returning remains of our servicemen to their country of origin. That's what repatriation is all about. I've heard that it is very rewarding work. I don't do this kind of work uh, and there's not a lot of, of money involved with this, but the folks are doing it for the, for the pay, um, for the personal satisfaction, right? So um, most of the, of the work here is, um, is in recent wars, these particular wars of World War II, Korea and Vietnam. Um, and certain genealogical credentials are required to do this work uh, from the companies that do this, like an accredited genealogist through ICAPGen or a certified genealogist through BCG. Um, so uh, this is work that is, I, to my experience, uh, I don't do because I don't have either one of those credentials, but um, most, most folks who do are, are working there. So, 
this is World War II, and the numbers are absolutely staggering. If we look at just the letter here, this is on the uh, POW MIA accounting website here. And you can see that there's the letter of the last name, as well as the, uh, the, the service areas as to where the, the numbers are that correspond to the last number, as well as the total. Uh, I took this as a screenshot off of the POW, POW MIA website. And we scroll down on here, and you can see that there's a total uh, of 73,000. Uh, of folks that are that are unaccounted for uh, from our from just um, World War II. Um, so as we go on more screenshots on this website, I went and did one for unaccounted uh, folks from the Vietnam War just for Massachusetts, and I encountered one. Oops, excuse me, um, from the fourth one down of Warren William Bowl. Uh, 1968 data from Marblehead Neck, Massachusetts. That's, I grew up there. My sister knew them, uh, knew the Bowles family. I've, I've heard of them, but my sister was was friends with their, with one of the sisters of that family. So um, again, it, it gives the status, it gives the date of the incident, uh, the, the country of the casualty, as well as the service that the, that the soldier was involved with. So the, uh, the, the recovery missions um, have lots and lots of considerations to recover our servicemen overseas. Um, they are scheduled one year out. Um, they have to get together with the host government. Uh, the weather needs to be cooperate. These are remote sites um, and they need lo big time logistical uh, support to, to get to these places, okay? Um, it's remote uh, uh, terrain. Um, here's an anthropologist here, Dr. Rebecca Taylor is in that picture. Um, and she sets up a grid unit and, prep and preparing for an excavation as part of what they call the JPAC recovery mission. Uh, this was in Laos back in 2014. Um, this is right off of the Department of Defense website. Um, of course, when we're going into a Vietnamese jungle up there on the left, it can be hazardous terrain, um, as well as we have all kinds of nice visitors that might come around as well, too, for, for these folks. Um, we have PhDs. These are PhDs, very well-educated anthropologists with, with shovels and gloves. Here's a couple of forensic genealogists uh, with, with a recovery leader. Uh, from the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command. And they're, again, they're setting up a grid unit uh, with assistance from uh, uh, another local person here. And this is in Espiritu Santo in Venatua, uh, the country of Venatua in 2012. Um, and these are specialized teams deployed from Hawaii, which is the POW MIA Accounting Office out there excavate you know several ground and aircraft crash sites um, from Americans who were unaccounted for in World War II. Lots of deep water recoveries, or they're, they're attempted anyway. These are a bunch of Navy divers that are assigned um, to a mobile diving and, and salvage unit. Um, and again, they've got the American flag underneath here. This was the wreckage of a B-17 bomber that was shot down and sank during World War II. So the the team is deployed alongside uh, the JPAC team. Um, and this was from the United States uh, Naval Ship Grapple uh, that was a part of a, of a 30 day underwater recovery mission uh, for unaccounted for servicemen who, who, who were missing during this crash that occurred um, in the Mediterranean. So once again, the total numbers here, again, 73,000 World War II, uh, that's most of them. Uh, there's 1,600 in Vietnam and about 1,800 in Korea. Um, so once again, cooperation with those benefits is something that's going to be, that's certainly going to be needed. So DNA, we're getting to our theme here of DNA. Uh, it is certainly not the, the be all and end all of identification like some of the TV shows that might make, you, make us believe because DNA does degrade with the death of an organism. It certainly depends on the, the environmental conditions and how fast. There's a guy named Jim Canick who told me of the recovery of a, 
of uh, in Alaska from a plane crash in 1952 was very successful. The recovery went well because of uh, because of the environmental conditions. Um, there are other records like dental analysis that can be used. That's good for Vietnam Vietnam veterans um, because um, the enamel in teeth um, helps preserve teeth for identifying folks through dental records because the, sea, the soil in Vietnam is very acidic and it eats away at, at, at remains, but, um, uh, but the teeth can be identified uh, because, uh, because the enamel helps preserve the teeth. Um, however, before that, dental identification is tough because of the, the fire that occurred in 1973 in which uh, those service records were destroyed that some of you may have heard about. So there are other ways of identifying folks through personal effects and, and archaeology and all those kinds of great things. So DNA come, comes from the next of kin. It's matched up to the DNA that is recovered from a site. Um, and the usual method of DNA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is, is a spitting into a tube or for an oral swab, which is very non-invasive. Uh, it can be done uh, by the donor versus you know, a blood draw, which requires a, a phlebotomist. Um, prior to 2004, uh, the collection was a blood draw, but the improvement of, of swab collectors and testing procedures, uh, testing procedures, and this is now uh, the method of choice. Um, so the, the, the list of items are all possible sources of human DNA for the donor. Um, other items that could be possibly have DNA um, of a given individual can be introduced through the use of that particular item. Um, not all not all alternative uh, references provide the same success in obtaining DNA. Some objects like toothbrush, combs, razors, things like that uh, work extremely well because they're only used by one person. Uh, but articles of clothing, um, you know, like the sweatband in a um, in a cap, um, that could be determined. That could be used by several people, and the DNA can get contaminated, mixed up. So here's some alternative sources of, of DNA that can be obtained from the next of kin. I mean, saliva from an envelope. Um, Jim Canick from, from Hawaii told me a story about IDing a match of a sample from a, a guy with a pair of golf clubs. Uh, he, he had passed on and the remains were found. Um, uh, but most cases aren't really all that straightforward. Um, you know, enough said. So the, the Department of Defense going forward is collecting DNA for all folks who are entering the military. Uh, all branches, they're, they're connected on a blood stain card. It's not tight for gloves, uh, for, for blood, excuse me. And it's collected at over 1,100 sites for our men in military. Again, all branches um, of, the, of the military. Um, so now uh, they've been used um, in 6,500 death investigations since 1992. Um, and they have about 7.1 million samples as of 2015. Okay. So what's the role of the genealogist here, you ask? If you have credentials or want to appreciate what's being done here, um, they're given the case file, the date of birth of parents, uh, where they're from, military information, family information, and once again, most most inf most cases are from Korea, Vietnam, World War II. Uh, that's although some go back to the Civil War, World War One. Okay. Um, the goal is to find next of kin and DNA donors. So we find close relatives like nieces, nephews, um, you know, kids for DNA samples to 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 match up remains that are found. Uh, most of the families are contacted, uh, preferably by phone the genealogist or male, uh, which they are actually more than happy to receive, again, from, from folks that I hear about that do this sort of thing. Um, this is something that the Army in particular, uh, one genealogist was telling me that they cap the fees. Uh, so genealogists are not doing this to make money. They're, they're doing this because it's great work to be done. Um, and reports are filed. Uh, with different branches. Different branches require different reports in a certain format. There's a company called SNA International that does this, and I hear that they have a template. Um, if the Army is looking for, say, one autosomal donor, then one DNA donor, and 
three mitochondrial donors. That's their, their standard. Um, and once again, you know, dental records are used, um, skeletal remains, x-rays could be used as well. Um, but it's certainly not the magic bullet that uh, the CSA crime shows uh, would lead us to believe. And I did mention that uh, credentials are needed, CG, AG, um, uh, to, to do this sort of work. So each one, each sort of service, you know, contracts out with, uh, and then again, this list, I'm, I'm, I apologize, this might not be, I believe DD is still doing the Navy's work. There's an outfit called Lithic Genealogy that I'm 99% I sure is still doing the Air Force work. And there is one woman, uh, Sandy Peel, she's the coordinator for the Marine Corps, at Sandy Peel, um, LLC. Finishing up here, folks, um, I think I'm right at about time, but just to mention a few other things about what uh, other applications there are for forensic genealogy. Um, most of the states in this country have um, capital punishment and there are capital mitigation um, um, proceedings that go through the American Bar Association. They develop guidelines for defense teams and these mitigation teams. Um, so it's part of the appeals process uh, for somebody who's been sentenced to death uh, to examine the family history of the defendant for three generations that might have mitigating factors uh, in their sentence to, to reduce their death sentence. So they look at records such as school records, family histories, birth, marriage records, court records, the stuff that we genealogists look for in these, in these military cases. Okay. Um, there is, every state that I know of has abandoned property, uh, bank accounts, life insurance policies, things that we forget about, um, and they that have been escheated, that's the legal term, escheated, uh, to the state, um, and in, in my state, it's turned over to the state treasurer's office. I believe a, a number of other states are doing the same thing. And most states will give a percentage to of recovery to the forensic genealogy by law, um, and states publish these in the newspaper and, and more and more online. Um, there are quiet title actions. This is the real estate industry. This is a good amount of the work that I do. Um, in which a lawsuit is, it needs to be brought to perfect a title for a piece of land, which might have outstanding um, uh, ownership to the land in some way, shape, or form. So it's all about cleaning up title for real estate divisions and adverse possessions, in which somebody wants to take advantage of, to take possession of a piece of land uh, that has been, uh, where the ownership is in suspect for years, uh, uh, years ago. Um, guardianships, that's another probate proceeding as well, in which, uh, you know, parents of the incapacitated need to be found or re other relatives found by an attorney or a genealogist uh, to speak for somebody who can't act under their own volition, um, as well as their volunteer opportunities. If somebody wants to get started with this, and this, this is nice because this is my last slide, so this is a great way to get started, um, is through the Council for Advancement of Forensic Genealogy. Um, they do have uh, volunteer opportunities in which you can uh, find foster kids who've aged out of the system uh, and their parents uh, need to be found for legal purposes. Uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't pay any money, but again, it's good practice in, in this growing, expanding, and I believe fascinating world of forensic genealogy. So just in conclusion, folks, sorry, this is my second to last slide. Forensic genealogists, it's dynamic, it's growing, it's incredibly challenging, and this is not for the beginning genealogists. It's, it needs experience. Um, if you're working towards credentials to be a certified genealogist or an accredited genealogist, then God bless you. Uh, it requires a lot of work. And um, my last word of advice here is if you choose to pursue this is to have fun, because to me, this is a, a lot of fun. and. Uh, and uh, that's the name of the game when it comes to genealogy. And that's what I've got, folks. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, if you, you want to um, stop sharing, we can do that. We can we do can that. We can get to some questions. All righty okay. then. Um, we have questions. Um, Okay, about 
adoption. So this came up when you were talking about adoption. Yes. And somebody said, with DNA testing becoming more available, do you see any state changing their laws regarding access to adoption records in the future? Is that is that kind of the impetus behind some of the laws being changed? I believe it's forcing the issue. That is my opinion. And I believe that we are becoming more and more of an open society. I can tell you from my personal experience as an adoptive father, I have an open adoption. My, my daughter knows the birth, knows her birth mother knows her birth uh, father and the professionals in the field advised me and my wife when we adopted her 15 years ago that that there are better outcomes associated with open adoption because we all have to have that need i believe to know where we come from where our origins are and i don't think i need to sell that to a genealogical audience <laughs> um there is a um a, a great website uh, run by an adopted guy i think his name is greg loose it's called bastard nation and it's on your web it's on your handout and he i'm on his list this is how i keep up to date on it and he he was the one who informed me that that new york and massachusetts just within the last several months have opened up their uh, original birth certificates uh, to adoptees and um again i see it as a trend mm -hmm. um i've been giving my adoption talk for for three or four years i think there was excuse me, six states that had open uh, birth, access to open birth certificates, original birth certificates for adoptees, and now we're up to 12. And that's just the last mm -hmm. couple of years. So mm -hmm. again, things are becoming more open. And I think um, uh, DNA has to do with it as well as our society um, being uh, realizing the advantages of outcomes that we all have to have that uh, yearning for who we are and where we came from. It, it makes us a more whole person but there are other opinions on that you know, there are other folks who who believe that closed adoption is something that is is the better way to go and again uh, it's it's a debate for another day <laughs> right yeah but you know where it, i stand yes <laughs> well i'm kind of there with you um the uh, in the chat, some people were um, posting about their own experiences of getting adoption records out of ohio and louisiana as well yeah. Okay, so then we have questions mostly about uh, the profession. We had somebody that asked you to repeat that information about where they could do the volunteering that you spoke um, about at the very end. Yes, the, it's called the Council for the Advancement of Forensic Genealogy. Full disclosure, folks, it is a organization uh, that I am the president of, the new, uh, so you know, we're always looking for new members who are interested in forensic genealogy. Um, and um, yeah, we can, we do have uh, volunteer opportunities that, um, that, that are out there. Okay, that's cool. I put that in the chat so people can see it. All right, then we had some people that are wanting to get into this perhaps as a field. And one of them asked what, what what area of forensic genealogy is going to have maybe likely to be in most demand for someone who's thinking of getting into this? I would say, first of all, you have to have credentials to do military repatriation. You do not have to do that to do adoption searches or, or air search. Um, but what comes to mind and answer, I hope by answering that, that question, there's, there's a new program that's come out in forensic genealogy from the University of New Haven. They have a forensic um, program there, an undergraduate program, but they've recently come out with a certificate program um, that is um, a little pricey, to be honest with you. I, I looked into it, um, but that's where you can get a certificate in forensic uh, genealogy and, and, and all with the genealogical elements. So it does, it's for, it's geared quite a bit for folks with um, who want to help out law enforcement uh, track down because DNA is matched up from crime scenes and compared in genealogical databases. Um, and it's geared towards a lot of folks who are professionals in that field in law enforcement. Um, but uh, other areas of forensic genealogy are covered too. There's a great uh, forensic genealogist guy by the name of Mark Wentling, who's a friend of mine in Massachusetts, and he he teaches in that program, and he's really good. So uh, it's got to be a good program if Mark's associated with it. 
And you said that was the University of New Haven, Connecticut? University of New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, I, 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 I probably should have put that in the handout. I don't think I did. But um, that is a program. Please Google it, the uh, University of New Haven Forensic uh, Genealogy Certificate or something like that. It should, it should come up. And so we did have somebody that asked about salaries. Um, can you can you give a so you were talking hourly? Um, is yeah. most of this an hourly sort of thing where you would set your fee and you would say, I'm going to charge this much per hour? Is that is that how it's done or how is it? Well, again, for different types of things, the uh, again, I'm told for army repatriation that it's a capped fee. So you're not going to make a lot of money when doing military repatriation work. Mm -hmm. Air search um, for myself and I believe ones who care about ethics, uh, we charge by the hour. It's usually a higher rate per hour as compared to a traditional genealogist. Again, because there's there's legal implications for it. There's legal liability associated with it. Um, it requires advanced genealogists. So uh, it's not unusual for, for folks to be charging in excess of $100 per hour to, mm -hmm. to do that kind of work for, for the legal profession uh, for doing air search work. Uh, primarily the customers there, I should have mentioned it, are usually family law, elder law attorneys, um, estate attorneys, you know, who specialize in, in that sort of work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I hope I answered the question, Sarah. I think so, yes. Um, I think our last question is about um, the, a person who's really wanting to um, get into helping catch criminals like CC Moore does. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Would the New Haven, Connecticut thing be a good thing for that person to look into or what other things could they do to try to get into more the criminal um, investigative genetic genealogy? I believe that uh, the one that I know of, the, the University of New Haven program is the one that I know of that's, that's as far as I know, that's the leading program associated with it. Um, mm -hmm. I had heard that uh, that CC was starting a new group in, in investigative genealogists, um, but I, I, I got to give her a call on it because I just heard that a, a week or two ago. He has a Facebook group, which I put in the chat, called Investigative Genetic Genealogy, and you can join that Facebook group, and um, you will get information there. And it is it is CC's Facebook group, so um, okay. you know, run by her and her. Um, administrators so sure yeah and if you don't know cc Moore, she is absolutely you know one of the leaders in this field yes yes yeah. and also in adoption research she's the reason that i got into doing um my my work with adoptees so yeah cc Moore, sure. it's great yeah um Fabulous. all right i think that that is our questions and i i know i learned a lot i didn't know all the different facets of um forensic genealogy myself so thank you very much for um sharing okay. with us tonight and um I'm glad it was helpful it was it was and i think everybody loved it we got a lot of good comments in the chat so all right everyone well we will see you um today's thursday we will see you next week on tuesday at 2 30 for our next presentation good night great